All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Brooke, and I work with Nebraska Agriculture in the classroom. And I'm really excited for you guys to join us today. I have my friend Marissa and her neighbor Kenny, who is a corn farmer. Marissa is an agronomist. And so they're going to talk and share a little bit about how they prepare for spring planting and kind of what it looks like for farmers to be um, good stewards of our land to take care of it as we continue to provide our most basic needs. So to get started, we're going to learn all about corn. So Marissa and Kenny, you guys are near Kenny's cornfield here. I know we kind of moved up to the top of the hill so we could get some better service this afternoon. But Nebraska, we pride ourselves in corn production. It's one of the top crops that we grow here in Nebraska. In fact, we're number three overall in all 50 states for corn production. And most of our corn that we grow here in Nebraska is actually fed to our livestock animals. So our pigs, our chickens, our beef cattle, dairy cattle, we can feed as well. And we use it for other byproducts. So we get things like corn oil that looks like this. So if any of your parents have oils that they use for baking or cooking, sometimes it's corn. We also get corn syrup. So if any of you like soda pops, a lot of our sodas that we drink have a little bit of corn syrup in it. If you like candy, most of our candies have a little bit of corn in it as well. And then we get a product called corn starch. Have any of you ever heard of corn starch? That's this white little powder. It kind of looks like flour, but it's kind of flour made from corn. And so sometimes if you guys make slime or different things like that, you might use corn starch to help us. But we're going to learn a little bit about where those three products come from because they help us make our fireworks, our toothpaste, and even the chalk we like to color with. So today you guys are going to have the opportunity to ask Marissa and Kennedy, or excuse me, Kennedy, Kenny, <laughs> some questions about their farms. And then we're going to see how Kenny really gets ready to prepare for spring planting. So in the next couple of weeks, Kenny's going to be out in his fields planting corn once the ground is a little bit warmer to plant. All right, Marissa, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Hi, guys. My name is Marissa and I'm an agronomist. So that means I get to help farmers like my friend Kenny and I help be the doctor for the crops and the soil. So just like when you guys go to the doctor and when something might be wrong or just for a checkup, that's my job, except I work with crops and soil and the bugs in the soil. So that's what I do. And I work with growers like Kenny all year round until we harvest the crop. So Marissa, did you grow up on a farm or what's your background to agriculture? Yeah, I didn't grow up on a farm. I actually lived in town and my family had a cattle ranch, but I decided that I wanted to work with crops because I really liked the science piece of it. Very good. Yeah. Kenny, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, I did grow up on a farm. Um, actually, we're right across the road from where my great grandfather started in 1911, and I, I live there now. So long, long farming history. Uh, I've been farming ever since I got out of college, right around 2001. Wow. Did you guys go to school to have the careers that you have today? Or what's kind of your background with agriculture and education? Uh, for me, I was in, you know, in, in high school, I was in FFA and everything in the, in the traditional agriculture. Uh, for college, I actually went to a two-year college for diesel tech. So I have a diesel tech degree so, from more of the mechanical side. So you're learning how all of those pieces of equipment work. And that's probably really important to you as a farmer because you have to be able to fix some of your equipment in um, a short instance if something's not going right. Correct. I just had a breakdown on the sprayer this morning, just got done fixing it. So it comes in handy. Oh, no. very good. That's unfortunate. We have those issues that we run into there. Marissa, what did you go to school for? What kind of classes did you take? Yeah, so I went to school in for college. I went to the University of Nebraska and I took a course called Agronomy Soil Science. So there I got to learn about all of the different diseases that affect the plants and all about the bugs that live in the soil. 
and about some of the chemicals that we sometimes have to spray on the crops to eliminate weeds and other bad bugs that we don't need in the field. And then just nutrition about how we help the crops grow. Very good. So you said you went to school to be an agronomist and an agronomist is kind of like a doctor for plants and you're looking at how they grow in the soil and all of that. When we plant our seeds in Nebraska, farmers have to wait till their ground is about 50 degrees, I believe, before they can start to plant their seeds so that they'll survive through the rest of spring into summer. So farmers, they'll plant their seeds in the spring, they'll grow all summer long, and then we'll harvest them hopefully before the first snowfall and it becomes too cold to get those seeds out of the ground. But in Nebraska, because we grow so many different types of corn, I wanted to share some of that corn that we do grow. How many of you like to eat sweet corn or corn on the cob in the summertime? There we go. So of all of the corn we grow in Nebraska, only about 1% of it is sweet corn. So we don't grow a whole lot of sweet corn because we have a lot of other types of corn that we grow. Another type of corn we grow is this white corn. And farmers grow this, sometimes we call it food grade corn. So do any of you like Fritos or Doritos or Cheetos or corn pop cereal, corn flakes? We use this to make all of our food products that come from corn. So that's pretty important to us. This one is really cool too. How many of you have been to the movies before and you might've had a tasty popcorn treat? or at home, maybe you put a bag of popcorn in your microwave. This is what popcorn looks like. And it grows on a cob just like the other types of corn that we eat. And the fun fact about Nebraska is we are number one in popcorn production in the United States. So we grow more popcorn than any other state. It grows on a cob just like all of the other corn that we grow. And then our final type that we grow a lot of, it grows on a reddish brown cob. We call this field corn, or sometimes if we look really close at those kernels, we can call it dent corn because it has all of these tiny little dents. That's where we get a lot of our corn starch, corn oils, corn syrup. This type of corn is fed to our livestock animals and to make ethanol and all of those other byproducts we previously talked about. Penny, what kind of corn do you grow on your farm? Uh, mostly yellow dent, but I have grown white corn before. Okay. Very good. So we, you, you mentioned popcorn. We have a lot of popcorn production around us real close also. Yes. So you guys are kind of in the area of Brunswick, Nebraska. Yeah. So can you tell us what area of the state that's located at for some of us that are joining? Uh, I didn't know northeastern, north central, however you want to look at it, but northeastern technically. <laughs> northeastern. So we're kind of up in the northeastern part of Nebraska. There. This, is the, this is our oh. Oh. other lady. Here we go. Perfect. So we grow sweet corn, we grow popcorn, we grow field corn, and most of that corn we grow is that field corn to feed our livestock animals. In fact, we grow so much field corn, we have to feed it to our livestock animals because we have a lot of beef cattle in Nebraska that like to eat corn as well. So behind Marissa and Kenny, they are going to share a little bit about what they're going to do before Kenny starts to plant his field. So Kenny, can you tell us how you kind of prepare for spring planting? What do you have to do to make sure you're ready to plant your seeds this spring? Uh, for spring planting, what I'm actually doing right now with the sprayer is putting fertilizer on. We use a liquid product for fertilizer. For, it's just, it's crop nutrition. It's what's the, what the plant grow, lives on all year. So we have to put some of that out ahead of time so it's healthy and grows good. And then throughout the year, we'll give it more through the irrigation systems along with water. But that's that's a lot of the prep is just getting the fertility ready. And then the other mm -hmm. thing the sprayer does, it's it's just like in your garden or things like that. You have to keep the weeds out of the crop so the crop grows well. And that's that's the other thing we do. We do some weed control with, with sprays and things we put through the sprayer. Okay, awesome. So I have a little bit, of, a few more questions to ask you. We have the, the sprayer for our tractor hooked up now. Eventually, Kenny will have to put on the planter, which will hold all of the seeds for planting. But when you spray your field for fertilizers, do you have to have like a certain, um, I guess, ration that you mix together um, for all of the fertilizers that you use? Or how do you get that prepared to spray on your fields? And then 
that's that's where Marissa or a lot of the agronomists come in. There are different analysis, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, zinc. There's a lot of different nutrients that have to be in balance for that crop to grow right. And it's also very expensive, so we don't want to waste it. We want to keep that ratio right so we can have a good crop. So do you reach out to Marissa to get recommendations on what kind of solution that you should be applying to your fields? Correct. Correct. A lot, a lot of us, a lot of farmers, some of us have some of that in their head and some of us, we do have to talk to experts and just even if we're trying new things, that's yeah. when it definitely yeah. comes into play too. So wonderful. Could you, t could you walk up closer to and show us a little bit? I don't know how great the service is, but maybe we can see how big that sprayer is and how, how much it covers. Yep. We're, we're on a hill. So hopefully the service is good here. <laughs> But it's, uh, I don't know how good you guys, since you can see some of the boom, it's a 120 foot boom. So it's covering 120 foot every time it goes through the field. And each one of those little nozzles you see sticking out, that's where the liquid comes out of it. They're on 15 inch spacing. So I think there's around 96 of those nozzles on it. The tank on it holds 1200 gallon and it just depends on the product. Right now I'm putting 24 gallon an acre on. Sometimes you might be down to as low as 10 to 12 gallon an acre when we're going through the field. So, okay. And I do have to, Go, go ahead. Oh, so you can cover multiple acres before you have to refill that tank. Yeah, Should like so it depends on the product. A lot of times, sometimes up to 75 acres to 50 acres, just depending on how what my application is. So an acre is how a farmer measures their fields. One acre is about the size of a football field. So you mm -hmm. hear farmers oftentimes when they're talking about planting or harvesting, they're going to measure in acres of land there. So we kind of talked how we have to use math and science to calculate the correct um, kind of spray to apply to your fields. Do you have to have any special permits to apply any types of sprays or what's the difference there? I bet some of them you can you can apply without having permits, but. Right, there's certain, most of your fertilizers I could apply without a license, but I actually have a commercial applicator's license so I can go do custom work for people. There's also certain chemicals, if they're somewhat dangerous to either the person applying or the environment, they're restricted use. So they, they guard who can apply them and you have to have special permits and special training to be able to do that. It's all, it all comes back to the safety. It all comes back to how much you can put on, how much you should put on and, and environmental concerns. Yes, so you guys are trying to care for the land as you're applying those things, but you also have to prevent weeds, but your plants need nutrients to grow too. So it's all kind of a mix and a balance to get the right um, portions onto those fields there. I have a question for you, Kenny. I, I'm not familiar with this, but as you spray your fields, do you use any type of technology to track where you're spraying or what you're applying? We, we have a lot of technology, especially in the, especially in the sprayer. Uh, it's, it's GPS guided. It's, uh, it's actually RTK, which is sub inch. I can come back every year and follow the same tracks within an inch. It's real similar to when your parents are driving, when they're using their, their maps and their navigation, it's GPS doing that. That's about four foot accuracy. This is within an inch that it can wow. give me. And then also the boom when it's applying, it has swath control. So if I spray and then I come back, it knows where I've sprayed and it shuts the nozzles off automatically for me as I'm going. And it also controls the application based on speed. It, back 25, 30 years ago, you had to do that all manually. There were some ways, there were some things you did and now it's, it's all automatic. Wow, that's amazing. Does anybody have any questions for Kenny about how he sprays his fields or any questions for Marissa as we continue? If you have a question, feel free to raise your hand, come up to the screen, I'll call in your classroom and then you can unmute yourself. All right, I see one and this is, uh, Mrs. Rizitska. Shield. Hey, Keegan, you don't want to? Nevaeh, um, come up to the screen so he can see you. He can't see you otherwise. Right here, that's the camera. Right. How long does it exactly probably take to like, like har harvest a field for corn? To harvest a field, it depends on the size of the machine, but usually we can do one of the square fields you see out in the country a lot of times takes us about a day, day and a half. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh, do we have other questions? All right, I'll take another one from your classroom. 
Okay. Meadow. How long does it take to spray like three fields? It depends. Like the different acres. But right now on my monitor, I cover about 150 acres an hour. But that doesn't include mix time. It takes me probably just about as long to mix. mix so off. spring goes really fast. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah, go ahead. I see a question right up here on the screen. Uh, how do you how do you operate the sprayer? Ooh. It's it's basically just about like think about like, hey marissa would you be able to to maybe stop. walk closer to your vehicle you're kind of cutting out on my end so it has a lever one way goes for and then you pull back and you get to a certain spot and it starts going in reverse we no we so. were under the the sprayer <laughs> Sorry, we, we kind of missed what you were saying, Kenny. I might have you repeat what you were telling us. Uh, just just for how it, how you move the sprayer, it's kind of it's almost like a lawnmower. It has a lever that's a hydrostat. So if you push forward, it goes faster forward, and then you go to neutral and come back, and it's it's reversed the same way. It's variable speed. Okay, so you can kind of control it just right there in the tractor. All right, I see another question. Um, let's see in the, sorry, some of your names on your screen in the admin. That's okay. Sorry. That's Mrs. Moeller. Thank you. <laughs> oh, go ahead. How long do you usually keep your cattle? They're talking about corn though. Oh. Dang. We're getting confused. Oh no, you're Let's, fine. I I don't know, Kenny. Do you raise any cattle on your farm? We we got. I used to have cow calf. Right now we have four H calves for the kids. But we do bring uh, cows in in the winter to graze the stocks to graze the Ooh. corn. What the harvester misses, we bring cows in and they eat that. So yeah, cows are a big part of the farm. Yes, that's kind of fun. We're gonna talk a little bit more about some of that as we continue on. But Kenny, after you guys have your field sprayed. And you're ready to begin planting. You grab. You guys have seed. Can you show us those bags of seed that you'll eventually load into your planter? Yep, I yeah. can go. I can bring two miles. You guys see how big that is? It's ginormous. It yeah, it covers a lot of ground there. Okay, so you have two different types of corn there. Will you tell us what you have in front of you? This this one here with the color on it, it's actually to protect it when we plant it. This is seed corn. And then this here is like what it is when we harvest it. This would be yellow dent corn. has a yellow color to it. So you'll load that into your planters. Your planter mm -hmm. has amazing technology that tracks where your seeds go. But I have a question. So you have to buy that red coated seed corn. Why can't you just use the corn that you harvested the previous year? It's due to the fact that it's a hybrid. It's a hybrid because it yields so much better, but when it's a hybrid, you can't replant the seed that's been produced from it. You have to start out with a new parent. That's that's where hybrid, that's where the new seed comes from every year. It will, it'll grow, the, the stuff that we raise will grow, but it will not, it isn't near as good. So, so what does the pre-treated corn help produce rather than just planting those seeds? Does it help prevent, can you tell, does it help prevent this disease? Does it help prevent? Correct, a, a lot of it, a lot of it is there's insect control and there's also fungicide on it, it helps for disease, soil borne diseases like rotting and, and things along those lines. It, it protects us to let it get sprouted and then start growing. Wonderful. So as we think about the agronomist side, Marissa, we're going to kind of bring you into this now too. Now that we know that Kenny has to spray his fields, put nutrients onto the soil. He has a lot of machines and he's using math and science as he prepares for planting. But you as an agronomist 
also has have to use critical thinking and problem solving skills because you're kind of that doctor for plants today too but you're learning or you're working with skills in biology economics earth science ecology and genetics as well and you took a lot of those courses in college what kind of issues are you specifically helping farmers solve on their pro or on their farms yeah so as we work with growers to feed all of you guys and the entire world, something that we have to really focus on and that is what my job is all about is helping farmers to grow more of the crop, more of this at the end of the day. So you guys can have more Doritos or cookies with cornstarch in it or popcorn, whatever that might be. Um, because sometimes we have to be very careful about some of the chemicals that we're using and we want to make sure that we use the right amount. That way we leave our environment better than we found it. Yes. So when you go into farmer's fields, what kind of things are you looking for or what are you looking yeah. for? So I'll even show you guys right here. Can you see some of this grass that we have growing right here? Yeah, so look right here. This little guy that I just picked up, he might be really hard to see. That's actually a weed that popped through. And so that's what Kenny is going to be working on spraying on eventually too. And then we have a co-star here. We have a puppy. And then sass. sometimes <laughs> I sass, there's some indicators, other visual indicators. Can you guys see what colors those leaves are? Some of them are kind of yellow, huh? Some of that might be because we don't have enough nutrients in the crop. And that's what Kenny's putting on right now is more nutrients and more food for that grass. So those are just a couple of the things that we always look for when we're out visiting the field is to make sure that there's no weeds and that the plant is healthy. Very, very great. So you guys are looking at the weeds. So if there's a lot of weed problems, you might recommend that Kenny puts on maybe a herbicide. So that's to get rid of the weeds. A pesticide is to get rid of pests, like insects that are eating Kenny's crops. Fertilizers add nutrients to the soil to help the crops grow. But after you've examined that there's an issue, what do you recommend to the farmer or how do you set up a plan for the farmer to follow? Yeah, so sometimes Kenny and I would meet during the winter when there's no crops growing and we help put together a plan on what crops we're going to plant and the general food that we have to feed the crop. And some of these other decisions about the chemicals or the bugs, we have to address that in season because we never know what the weather is going to be like or what bugs are going to appear or even the weeds that are going to appear. Very good. So as you're looking at that, do you use any type of technology to help you make any farming decisions? Yeah, so we use a lot of math. So some of you guys probably like math and some maybe don't like math so much. But math is very important because farming is very expensive. And so we have to make sure that we spend our money wisely. So we use a lot of Excel spreadsheets to help keep track of that. And then we also have apps, like you guys have apps on your cell phones or your iPads. And that's where I help keep all of my notes and I can even drop pinpoints on maps and that lets me know where we might have a problem in the field. Okay. So do you guys ever use anything like drones or moisture tools to test soil or disease testing? Yeah, so we, we do a lot of drone testing and we can take pictures from up above so we can get a whole big picture of that entire field. And then for moisture, there are these probes that you can stick in the ground and it measures how much water is actually in the soil. And then there's labs, so scientists, where we'll actually send tissue or soil into, and they run all sorts of experiments and tests on that tissue and that soil. And it helps us identify what the disease might be or what the analysis, how much of the nutrients are in the crop. And that helps Kenny and I make our decisions. Very good. 
let's take a couple more questions. Are there any other questions that you can think of that you have right now that you would like to ask Marissa or Kenny? Let's see, I think I see one in um, Sam's class. If you would like to come on up, you can unmute your microphone and we'd love to answer your question. What's the dog's name? <laughs> Sassy, she's a blue healer. Very good, yes, farm dogs are the best dogs, aren't they? One more question. Yeah, one more question, go ahead. How much types of how much types of corn is there? Ooh. Does anybody else want to answer that question? <laughs> There's dent corn, uh, white corn, popcorn, and there are there's blue corn. There's all kinds of there's some other different ones too. Yes. So the ones the ones I shared with you today are the most popular that we grow in Nebraska is that sweet corn, the popcorn, the white corn, and then the field corn that gets used for our livestock animals. Let's see here. I see a couple hands in Mrs. Moeller's class. How much of your corn do you keep? Mm, good question. Oh, so How it, much of the corn do you much? keep? We, we actually, we just keep a little bit. My wife has some chickens and we have a little bit of cows. So we, we maybe keep a hundred, 200 bushels. So it's a real small truckload. The rest all goes to the elevator. It'll, it'll all go for food. Some of it goes for ethanol, a lot of all different end uses. Very good. So you're growing a lot of field corn, like you said, to feed those animals. Right. And then we, we do have a family sweet corn patch. So we do plant just a little bit of sweet corn to eat during the summer. Yes, that's the best time for us to eat, too. All right, let's go back to uh, Mrs. Shields' class. Um, how, much, how much money do you have to spend on corn and seeds? In seeds, it, it depends on the company, but a lot of times, uh, like a 50-pound bag that we get it in, it can be anywhere from 225 to $300 for one bag. And that plants about three acres. So I think it's pretty cool that you have all of that technology in your planter and you can tell exactly how many seeds get planted into your yep. field, how far apart they are. And then come harvest time, you get to actually measure that using some science too and that technology. Right. It, it counts, counts every single seed that comes out. We know that's how we plan a field is the population per acre, how many seeds per acre. Very good. Yeah. Let's see here. Hey, Do you have another real, one? Yeah. Real quick, we have to go to another class. They just wanted to say thank you to Kenny. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> thank you guys so much for joining. <laughs> All right, I see another question in Ms. Um, Stam's class. How long does it take for the crops to grow? Basically all summer. They'll get planted right around the 1st of May, and then we'll harvest about middle of October, 1st of November. Here we go. So it has several months to grow, but luckily in Nebraska, corn is a renewable resource, so we get to grow it every year and use it for more products. We're going to continue with um, one more portion of our virtual field trip, and then if we have any time at the end, we'll wrap up with questions. But Marissa, can you share a little bit about how agronomists work directly with our ecosystems in Nebraska? and how farmers use sustainable farming practices by taking care of the earth and caring for their land. Yeah, so part of our jobs are, as agronomists is to know what are good bugs and which are bad bugs. And the bad bugs really destroy the crops. They eat the roots or they damage the ear of corn and then we can't harvest that as well or we don't have as much to harvest at the end of the season. So that's a big part of that. And then when making those decisions about chemicals or nutrients or things like that, what we work with the farmers to identify is what we call the four R's. Does anybody know what the four R's might be? Or do you have guesses what the four R's might be? Ooh, there might be a couple. Ooh, there's one in Mrs. Moeller's class. Do you want to take a guess? R, 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 R. 
<laughs> Marissa, will you tell us what those mean? I will. So there's four R's. The first one is right time, right place, right rate, and right source. Did I say that one already? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so there's four of them, and those help us make sure that we're being very conscious about what we're doing and where we're doing it. So that way we leave our ground better than what we found it, but we can still produce enough to feed everybody in the world. Very good. So as we're looking at, like, we know we have to apply some of those things. Farmers have to use certain precautions when they apply those different things to their fields. But Kenny, do you guys use anything like cover crops or no-till versus tilling the soil? or terraces, windbreaks, what kind of helps you protect the soil and keep it in place? You know, a long time ago, my grandfathers and, and father and everything, you know, planted windbreaks. We still practice that today to help for wind, but we do, I, I do all no-till. I've probably been no-till for 15 years on everything on the farm. It, it helps for wind erosion, also helps conserve moisture. So it's, it's definitely a very important part. But at the same time, in order for me to no-till, there has to be certain chemistries and things mm -hmm. that allow me to do that. I, I know some of the, I'm sure you guys have heard of the word glyphosate for Roundup. That's one of the chemicals that come along that allowed us to be able to do that where we can plant into the old residue and still grow a good crop. So I noticed when, when Marissa was showing us closer to the ground, would you be able to show us a little bit about what no-till means? I know that I saw that you guys still have corn stalks kind of left behind there, which is actually keeping that soil in place. And you guys, you guys can probably see it. I know it's kind of hard for me to show you here. Uh, there's corn residue from the last, this would probably have been two years ago when it was corn. Last year, it was soybeans. There's a little bit of the residue here. And now right now I actually have a growing crop of wheat. This wheat will be harvested in July that's growing now. But that all helps protect the soil. This is a really sandy soil that's here. As you guys can see, it would blow away real easy if it wasn't protected. Very good. So farmers, a lot of farmers can practice kind of like what you have. You kind of, are you using wheat as a cover crop or do you usually plant this, wheat in your fields? This one will actually be go to grain. This will be wheat for harvest. We okay. use, traditionally we use rye for a cover crop. Wheat can come into play too, but rye works a lot better because it's a lot more winter hardy and grows a lot faster. Okay. Yeah. So that's interesting. So you're growing wheat in your fields, but you've also grown corn and soybean. And so that mm -hmm. kind of brings me back to crop rotation. Marissa, you probably give recommendations to farmers for crop rotation too. What's the benefit of switching our crops that we're growing? So we're not just growing corn in the field every single year. Yeah. So each crop has different nutrient needs, right? So like when we're playing sports, sometimes we have to eat a lot more because you're expending all of that energy. It's the same thing with our crops. And also some crops like corn or soybeans or wheat or alfalfa, those all attract different bugs. And sometimes as a way to mitigate not using as much chemicals, we rotate the crops. So just like Farmer Kenny showed us, there's soybean stalks in here, there's corn stalks in here, all of these different crops. So that way we break up the life cycle of all of these organisms and bugs that come here. That way we don't have to use quite as many chemicals. Very good. So you guys are really taking care of the soil. You're trying to prevent erosion, but you have to have the right amount of nutrients. You have to have those good bugs to help the plants grow by also looking at like windbreaks and terraces and no-till operations to protect that soil. But we also have to look at our water conservation. So what are some ways that you as a farmer and Marissa as an agronomist help farmers conserve water? Myself as a farmer, you mentioned the soil moisture uh, measurements. This field here actually has a soil probe on it. So we are watching the, the soil moisture content and everything. It measures every two inches on how much water is in the soil. So I don't over apply with irrigation or anything like that. The other thing is the no-till, leaving residue on the ground helps protect it and stops evaporation. That's, that's the main thing that we do. Good. Marissa, do you want to add anything to that? No, Farmer Kenny's got all of that covered. It's just all about keeping all of the rain in the soil, because if we lose the rain, we have to put water on 
And if you guys have ever had to move the sprinkler in your yard, think about that times about a thousand for making sure that the crop has enough water throughout the entire summer. Yes. So we track water very closely. And last summer, and I'm sure this summer currently, we're still kind of in a drought. And so we have to kind of monitor the amount of water. We hope that it rains so we don't have to use water irrigations, but farmers have different ways to control the amount of water getting applied to their fields, whether if you've ever driven by a farmer's field and you see those big sprinklers out in the center, those are called center pivots um, or irrigation pivots. They have drip irrigation or pipe irrigation, which can help flood the rows. So different farmers have different ways to water their crops when it doesn't rain. And a fun fact, one corn plant needs about four and a half cups of water a growing season. So if we think about that, that's not very much water that that plant needs to survive all season long when they're growing from the end of April to when we harvest it in the fall there. So we're going to kind of wrap up here um, today, but we know farmers have to be good stewards of the land. They have to care for their land, but they also have to use that land in order to provide us our most basic needs, whether it's food, clothing, all of the things in the world around us comes from the farm or from a natural resource. And we have to use some of those natural resources to help grow those food products. So I just wanted to say thank you to Marissa and farmer Kenny for taking time out of your guys' busy schedule to join us. Would you guys mind if we took two minutes and wrapped up with any last questions? Is that okay? Is there any questions that you guys would like to ask? Was there anybody from Mrs. Williamson's class? I know we haven't um, answered any questions from you guys. So if you guys have questions too, please come up um, to the screen. We'd love to answer those. Otherwise, let's take another question. We'll start in Sam's class. Um, around how much does it cost for all the equipment? It's, <laughs> it depends how new it is. It can get really expensive. This, this sprayer here is actually over 10 years old. Uh, and it's, you know, 150000 for something that old. If it was a brand new one, it would be closer to $400,000 for something like that. So your degree is probably really important because then you're able to fix some of that, those parts if something goes wrong. And your job is to make sure it's working properly so that you can continue to use it. There. Awesome. Let's see. Let's take another one um, in Mrs. Muller's class. There you go. What um color of tractor do you most prefer, green or red? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know if I'd say prefer, but I have all pretty well all green. Have all John Deere, and that's because the equipment dealer that's nearby that services is the best one. So that's the one I use. All right. Let's take another question from Stam's class. <laughs> Someone. Oh, yeah. Okay. What's your favorite type of equipment to use for farming? Oh boy, that's that's tough. It's hard because this time of year you get to see what you get to plant everything and, and hope it grows. But I, I like harvest the best because that's when you see all your hard work and see how well it did. So I, I like harvesting the crop. Yes, seeing all your hard work pay off. Let's take one more question, and I see a hand in Mrs. Moeller's class. Uh, Riley. How many acres of land do you own? Oh boy, you're gonna, I'm gonna have to do the math. Um, I own right around 800 acres and probably farm about 2,500. The rest is rented from other people that own the ground. There you go. Wow. So, you, so you get to, to kind of pick and choose what you're going to plant each year too. So it sounds like you grow a little bit of wheat and corn and soybeans. Those are all mm -hmm. top crops that farmers here in Nebraska grow. And so as we wrap up today, I just want to say thank you so much, Marissa and Kenny, for taking time out of your guys' busy schedules. I know you guys 
since you were broke down this morning, you're ready to get back <laughs> out there and um, get spraying. So we'll let you get back to that. But agriculture is the number one industry in Nebraska, and it's one of the top economic drivers in our state. And so um, as we talk about corn in Nebraska, it's a huge part of our state and our economy. And we grow field corn, seed corn, food grade corn, popcorn, and even a little bit of sweet corn. Nebraska exports corn domestically to other states and foreign countries to be used in our byproducts and things that we use every day. And farmers here in Nebraska, they take pride in their farms, producing corn for their families, livestock, and people all over the world. And farmers, they strive to be good stewards of the land. And they do that by protecting the soil, water, and our ecosystems around us. And agronomists, they provide support and help farmers use critical thinking and problem solving skills to help produce the best crops that are safe and healthy for all of us to consume. So thank you guys so much for sharing a little bit about how corn and all of our environment and ecosystems play together in order to provide our most basic needs. So thank you guys so much for joining us and thank you to all of the classrooms that joined us today as well. You guys have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love the dog. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks. Yeah. I am having.